All right, everybody, for segment one today, we are starting a new series where we talk Castles and Crusades 8th printing, not edition. Yeah, yeah. Printing. Uh, we covered 7th printing a little bit ago. And uh, I have we, we both had some issues with the editing of it because you could tell there were like three different authors uh, along yeah. with three different editors and they were written three different ways. True. And, yeah, I mean, and you, it was, you, you could turn the page and it's it's like it was written by a different person. You turn the page again, a third person shows up. Yeah. Like how many ghost writers were on this thing? Right. Um, and Heathen Dog really did not like the illusionist. No, I liked it. Was, it. It's it's like ca uh, calling a catalytic converter a battery you know like what 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 is historically defined as an illusionist in almost every game in the world they went another way I'm like I, mm. yeah, they, they on the other hand lantern, if i remember correctly <laughs> yeah yeah you're kind of right uh <laughs> from my perspective i did like the illusionist i like the way it was written up so again so finally a place where heathen dog and i just completely disagreed for once <laughs> but we're gonna see what eighth printing brings us now i don't have the hardcover of eighth printing yet i did back it on kickstarter um but i do have the pdfs obviously because you know they sent out the pdfs early so i'm just waiting on the hardcovers to get in here i think i got three or four books coming but uh so this is from the kickstarter and you can see the art i do like this art Generally, I mean, it's not like perfect so art. Thieves, every, everyone's like planning their their next like, OK, when we go in the dungeon, we have to make sure to. But then there's the on the on top of the statue, there's a thieves going, I got to get this jewel out of the eye. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is bank. You know, it's going to happen, though, that jewel's going to pop out and oh, then they're yeah, going to see yeah, like a little Indiana Jones moment. Going little on. mist is going to come out of there and yep. all of a sudden ghost is going to touch them all and they're going to be, you know, Rama Tet from yeah. Curse <laughs> yeah. of whatever is going to come out and steal your organs. Like, yeah, OK, fine. Yeah. Thanks a lot, thief. Dick. <laughs> can you at least wait till we get this haul out of here right here <laughs> yeah. at least give our family something and uh, a little bit brighter colors i don't typically like abstractish art but i think this is done well enough to say hey uh i, I like it well i like i think it's bright uh, i think because they saturated it well no in uh in comics and anime i like uh abstract or cgi only when something is is meant to look not human and not right and summoning a creature from beyond this universe should look a little weird to us it yeah. really should hurt your eye a little bit yeah fair enough so you know it gives it flavor yeah got the runes around the outside I, just generally I, I i tend to like you know i like my art to be very photorealistic in terms of i like the elmore art yes you could still tell it was a painting but it was you know closer to realism but that's just the way my brain works. I had to take a whole quarter in French class of impressionism, and I hated every second of it. <laughs> Fucking hate of ugh, impressionism's garbage. All right, so who put this book together? By David Chenault and Max Golden. Uh, Mac. Oh, Mac Golden. You're right. Sorry, can't read. This guy is cloudy. It yep, still is. Yep. Uh, with Stephen Chenault, Mark Sandy, Todd Gray, Jason Vay, and James M. Ward. Didn't he do Dungeons and Dragons? Didn't James Ward had something to do with second edition? I can't remember. Um, anywho, and you can see the other names on there. Edited by, okay, because <laughs> Derek Landweir and Anthony Foddy. Are you going to be my best friends or are we going to hate each other? I don't know yet. We're about to find out. To be fair, I did skim through it for just a moment, but then my eye exploded on me. So uh, that ended that. But uh, And contributors and so forth. Troll Lord Games. Eighth printing, not edition. I don't know why they're so adamant about that, but okay. I don't know why either. Um, we're, well, so what we're going to do today, I don't know if we're going to get through all the character classes. It depends on how much we talk about them, but we're only doing the character classes today. To answer your question, Shares, is everyone human? I don't know. Let's find out. Let's find out. Uh, acknowledgements. We're going to skip some of that because we tend to get long-winded. Special thanks to a whole bunch of people who probably backed the game back the game and maybe play tested that's yeah. usually how it works yep knights of the crusade lots of blank pages table of contents all right so creating character attributes attribute modifiers attribute check, See, classes. Uh, already i have i have a problem with this all right oh, oh god what <laughs> Be, it's just it's it's a pet peeve of mine I okay. understand this is not a, a deal breaker because it happens a lot and if it was a deal breaker for me i wouldn't be able to play many games but why would you make your character before you had classes classes and stuff explained? Aha! 
I've had this conversation a couple times recently, and this is where you and I are going to disagree completely. The ga- usually they're built, and I don't know if this is the fact behind this, but when I've paged through it, and Astonishing Swordsman Sorcerer Hyperbore is a perfect example of this one. If you open up the book, it's the process of play. You make your character first, you play the game second, you get your treasure third. Okay. So I understand what you and, and some even some people posted on our Discord saying, like, I don't care about making the character until I understand the rules of the game first. But it's the process of play. You know that the process of play is to create your character first, so it's going to be at the beginning of the book. You know that playing the game comes after that, so it's going to be in the middle of the book. And you know that treasure and uh, GM type stuff, whatever, experience points, leveling up, et cetera, et cetera, is going to happen after you play, so that's after that. That's my take on it. Anyway. I haven't read anything that said that's why it's done that way, but that, that seems to be why that flow is. Okay. See, uh, I, I like it because uh, let's, let's take uh, D&D as an example. You, you roll up your character. You've got uh, 10 strength, 11 dex, 11 wisdom, and uh, 9 intelligence. You can be several classes. Mm-hmm. None of them are going to be like super great because you're not, but you, but you could be several classes. But you, you, when you're creating your character, you're supposed to, you know, do all this blind without knowing what the classes are, which which one you like better, which one you want to go in. Now, if this doesn't do it that way, if it's just rolling up your character top to bottom and then filling in the modifiers and then you choose your class as it explains classes, that'd be great. That'd be great. If you're not allowed to move your move your attributes around or choose where they go, then it doesn't matter. But I always like choosing classes when I have an understanding of them first, not to min max, but to have a better understanding, especially because of, you know, uh, little curveballs like the illusionist is probably giving me another curveball where where you think it's something, but it's really not that. I'm, I'm going to put money like down that. on the fact that they did not change the illusionist and you're still going to be grumpy about it. Damn That's it. that my money is on that. OK, um, already I see an editing problem. Spell format, spell descriptions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One's capital, one's not. (laughs) I don't know why my eye catches that. Oh, it's because it was part of my job for a long time. Uh, So multi-classing. Okay, races. Oh, oh, nope. Not telling you yet, but it's got 10 pages on races. So I'm going to guess. I guess there's more than a couple. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Actually, I already know the answer to it, but. uh, Okay, example of play at the end. So anyway. That's, uh, we're role-playing and role-play. Oh my God, that's so fuzzy in my face. Uh, meat. I run my games fairly, fairly consistently. All of my games combine intense interaction between the players and myself with quick-moving, heart-stopping combats. Did you say that about yourself or did somebody come and say that to you? Just wonder. Seems a little. <laughs> now, I've heard that the, ga- that the creators of this game actually run really good games. Um... These many moments, actions, and interactions must be woven together over a night's play through exciting storytelling. Oh, crap. Where's the OSR, bro? Where where the OSR, bro? Or the bro OSR is to say you can't use that word. Through exciting storytelling and player involvement. When the tale is woven tight, what? I really like that. Player involvement, not agency. Not players running the show, right? Here, do we, do know, I need to blow you up for a second? The inmates running the asylum. Hold on. Let me, let me blow you up for a second. There you go. Show off your shirt. Oh, okay. By the way, you can get this shirt on the Legion of Myth Redbubble. Players are the natural enemy of a good story. Player agency not allowed. <laughs> That's the heathen dog shirt for you. Uh, exit solo layout. <laughs> okay. Uh, when the tale is woven tightly, emotions are awakened, creating unforgettable moods. This is where role-playing and role-playing meet. Can I zoom in on this a little bit more? You guys probably can't read that. Not that it matters too much. We're going to, yeah, it doesn't matter that much. I'm not reading all of this, by the way. I'm just reading this first paragraph. And the result is an electrifying evening of gaming. Yes, I, so I'm one of those people. I like emotion in my game. And I, like a sad, I like sad emotion in my game. I like happy emotion in my game. I like, you know, that's one of the reasons why I do what I do when I'm running games. I don't just want the description. I want to feel it. As, and I've told this story a lot, so I'm not going to tell the whole story. But I still feel the giant ant from the first time I played Dungeons and Dragons. And I was biking home at night going... <laughs> fucking two foot ant gonna come out of the hill and eat me because <laughs> uh, i have a phobia of bugs but uh you know, I, I, that's i want that so let's read the last paragraph also because you know those, those are your sandwiching paragraphs right sure. as 
A rules light adaptable game naturally engenders a gaming environment where one is bound only by imagination. Okay, I'm going to start tearing up here. <laughs> when, so, when so unleashed, one can act without restraint to create a gaming environment that is fun for all. That sounds like hashtag RPGate, doesn't it? A little bit. That is the core philosophy of this game, just as the core philosophy of the original game. At its heart, it was intended to be a fun game to play, and this game adheres to the same philosophy. Castles and Crusades is neither a realistic game nor a simulate. Hey, he stole that from me. I wrote that Aww. in the game I'm writing. He probably wrote it in all eight editions or printings, but I'm still I'm still crying foul for no reason. Uh, Castles and Crusades is neither a realistic game nor a simulation, but a fantasy game where imagination rules. OK, I didn't write that, but last part. No. All right. And you got some dwarfs on here smacking things with hammers. And right. well, we, we better looks... get to the classes be because there's a bunch of people in, in chat who are saying, where's the assassin? Where's the assassin? Didn't you have thoughts about the assassin when when we did the seventh printing? I did. All right. So what is a role playing game? We're, we're not, again, not going to read all of this. This is the basic stuff you find in most games. We will get yeah. to the classes because chat is clamoring for it. And we are here for chat. Our pe well, sort of here for chat. I mean, Heathen Dog got uh, $5 and I didn't. So oh, there I don't it know. is, Assassin. It's, it's there. It's there. Is it? Okay. Yeah, what do you need to? Page 14. Okay, we're, I'm getting there. I'm on 13. Dice. You have to have dice to play. Everyone knows that. Having fun. Got to have fun. A game does need rules. The key to this game, however, is simple. The more you get involved in playing your character and the less time you have to spend worrying about the rules of the game, the more fun it will become. Remember the old adage, rulings, not rules. That's for you game masters out there. Or, sorry, castle keepers. Castle keepers for this game. With that in mind, let's proceed to the next section of the book. All right, creating a character. Let's create some characters. Uh, well, uh, alphabetical order is not their friend. Seriously? I, I, I hope there's a reason for this. Because everything else in alphabetical order, this might be like one of those, okay, optionally, you can play an assassin. We'll see. I don't actually know. I really don't know. Yeah, do they move it to an optional character class? That'd be different. We'll find out, won't we? With the exception of the Castle Keeper, each person playing Castles and Crusades creates a character to use during the game. All right. Imagine the character decide in a general manner. Ah, in a general manner. Don't give me a 30-page background. But decide in a general manner, manner the type of character desired. So far, so good. I, I like the way that, that is written. That is a nice, concise sentence. I like that. Decide, in a general manner, the type of character desired. Is the character a noble dwarf fighter, a haggard half-orc barbarian, or a disdainful elf knight? What was that? Said so he's a big fan of the assassin class and didn't like having it at the front of the class. Oh, oh he isn't, isn't a big, big fan. Oh. Now, the, I liked the assassin class because uh, all of the other, it, it's the most customizable of all the classes. Because you get to choose what kind of assassin you are. You know, are you a spy assassin? Are you a James Bond assassin? You know, are you a Roger Moore James Bond assassin? Or are you more uh, current day, what, what's his name? Shoot everyone, ask questions later assassin? You know, whatever. But uh, apparently he didn't like it. That's fine. All right. Literature, film, theaters, and comic books are rife with examples of heroes and villains that players can draw upon for inspiration for their characters. Yet, as the creator of your own character, you can build upon those examples to com uh, create complex, villainous montages or even more profoundly heroic and noble characters. Stretch your imagination. Create the character as you imagine. Okay. What, what just happened there is every, every time he hits a they or them, he's going to bang his head against the table. It's, it's even money he knocks himself out by the end of the day. Uh, create the character you imagine him to be. Or create characters as you imagine them to be. Try fucking English. In the end, imagination is the only limit when creating a persona. God damn it. And I wanted okay, to do this game too. Six attributes, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Nothing super new there. Uh, choose a class. Uh, looks like there's 12. A thir 13 it says 12 plus one <laughs> plus uh, <clears throat> assassins uh, move to special class choose a race uh let's see the races are uh human elf dwarf gnome halfling half elf half orc do you I'm see oh, where, where do you see that i see choose, choose a, race. a race 
Oh, uh, long live elf, willful. Okay, curious gnome, quick footed. Yep. Yep. Each has its own special abilities, uh, capacities, culture, and personality. Closely examine each race prior to making a selection. In particular, ensure the race selected does not have cultural or personality characteristics that conflict harshly with the persona of your character you wish to create. Okay. So what it is is you can you make yeah you you cannot decide to be an elf because you like the stats and then play it like a halfling. All right, you can't do that. If you choose to play an elf, you are all in on being an elf. You have to act like an elf. You have to eat what elves eat. You have to do what elves do. You have to think how elves think. Because you decided to be an elf. Yes. And whether you look at it as a fantasy trope or bioessentialism or whatever you want, elves are not humans. They are not humans in funny skin suits. No. Elves are elves. They should feel alien. They should look alien. They should act alien to a human mind. In fact, I heard somebody say this. I'm not going to say I fully agree with this, but I get it conceptually, so I kind of want to repeat it. It should be hard to play an elf. It should be hard to play a dwarf because you're going to want to inject your human ideals into it, but they're completely different species. Now, with that said, I mean, they're in the game. It's got to be relatable somehow, but they're really just fantasy tropes. So, oh. And you've got hit points, uh, you know, that's common to most games. Uh, I don't think we need to explain what hit points are. If you lose hit points, you die. Now, how do you get hit points, though? Well, there's, op oops, uh, apparently that's optional rule. So what does it say to roll hit points? Listen to the character class. Okay, uh, hit points are determined by the character class. Standard rule calls for players to roll the appropriate die. Got it. By the way, that's another trend that I've been seeing. I'm glad they don't do here is people have been changing the word die to dice, even in the singular, because die sounds bad. We don't want to have that word. But the singular of dice is die. So at least they did that. Um, then there's the you just start with maximum. Yep. And with constitution modifier and the optional number two is you roll your hit points. Uh, the player rolls their character's hit point die the number of times equal to one plus their con bonus and takes the highest roll. They do this at the start of play, and for each level thereafter, Constitution modifier is added or subtracted. You know what? Starting at level one, starting out at max hit points for level one, and then rolling random die for every level after that, I don't have a big problem with that. I don't have a huge problem with that one, because you the because it's good. I don't know how many like wizards and thieves roll their one, or ro roll a two with a con modifier of minus one and like, ah, oh, damn it, one. Yeah, when, when I do D&D &D for like, you know, when I do run my second edition games, you roll in a D4. Uh, thieves roll a D6, but re-roll ones. Uh, clerics roll a D8, but re-roll ones and twos. And fighters re -roll, uh, roll a 10, uh, roll a 10, but re-roll ones, twos, and threes. Okay. I don't have a problem, you know, personally with uh, starting out at max hit points just at first level and then rolling everything else random mm -hmm. after that. I don't have a big problem with that. <laughs> Can I get a dollar instead? <laughs> uh, fleshing out the character. The most important step in character uh, generation comes last. Detailing the character's persona. The player fleshes out the details of the character's personality, physical description, world background, goals and motivations, including the moral alignment best suited to the character's personality. Again, perfectly well-written sentence. Use this going forward. Use this concept. Then the character's starting money is determined and the player equips the character with clothing, armor, weapons, and other adventuring gear. Great paragraph. By the way, whoever edited that, good paragraph. Attributes represent a character's physical and mental traits. Yeah, Strength, dex, con, intelligence, wisdom, charisma. Just like everything else. 3 to 18. Three to 18. Yep. Sure. Now, let's look at generation. 3D6. <laughs> yep. When's the last time you've seen a game in Force 3D6? Long time ago. Process repeated six times. Once the six scores are generated, each score is assigned to one. Oh, okay. It's not, it's not up and down. You can assign it. Yeah. So that means understanding the classes is more important because you get to choose where your stats go. By the way, it's saying that my eye is going to explode is not funny right now. <laughs> if you were here at the beginning because my eye did explode yesterday and i had to go to the emergency room that's why it's all foggy over here <laughs> actually it is kind of funny uh, but yes yeah, 3 to 18 so it's 3d6 and i don't see optional rules no there I, isn't. I already know 
Well, at my table, I always just do 46 reroll ones through threes. Hey, you know what? Then <laughs> you can homebrew that all you want, but the rules are 3d6, put them where you want them. Well, I homebrew it. You already know my system. Yeah. Uh, all you, right. You, you actually do not allow good luck or bad luck. <laughs> well, I allow it, but you have to be really lucky uh, on either end of it. No, nah, just foggy do the Halloween. There you go. No, I'm, I'm seriously like, you know what's funny is if I close my eye, it's easier to read. Um, so each attribute score has a corresponding modifier. So we'll get to that in a moment. And yeah. primary and secondary attributes. Now, this is important concept to this game. There are two types of attributes, primary and secondary. Primary attributes are those physical or mental abilities in which a character is particularly well-trained or very experienced in using. Secondary attributes are those the character uses with only average skill. A player selects the character's primary attributes after choosing a race and class, or a class and race. Uh, yeah, okay, we'll get, we'll get to that. Oh, we'll just read it. Human characters have three primary attributes, so half of them are primary. Demi-human races have only two primary attributes. Each class has one primary. So as a human, you get your class and then pick two more. As a demi-human, you get one from your class and one more. Well, that's not fair to demi-humans. Bullshit. It's overly they get, fair to... <laughs> they, get their, they get their racial bonuses. Shut yes, up. exactly. All right. Da, da, da. Let's see. Attribute checks. Now, this is where these primary and secondary attributes come into play. As mentioned before, the distinction between primary and secondary attributes is important. Almost all non-combat actions in Castles and Crusades for which the Castle Keeper deems a role is necessary to determine success or failure are resolved by an attribute check. Every check has an associated attribute. Okay, we got that. So, okay, roll a d20. So whenever one of these checks is made, a d20 is rolled by the player. Attribute modifiers are added to this roll, as is the character's level, if applicable. Which, which it almost always is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if the if the result is equal to or greater than a number generated by the castle keeper called the challenge class then the attribute check is successful challenge class is a number generated blah 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 blah, blah. okay if associated attribute is primary attribute the challenge base is 12 now of course if he, if he thinks it's easier for you or harder for you the castle keeper will change that but it starts at a 12 that's for your uh, primary attribute so if you're first level and you've got a plus two because of a high attribute that's three, right? Three, add three to your D20 roll. So you're rolling a D20 plus three. You've got to get a 12 or higher. You've got actually a better than 50% chance of making that happen. Yeah, at first level, that's pretty good. Right. Now, of course, other modifiers can come in. But if it's a secondary attribute, the challenge base is 18. Now that D20 plus three is looking a little harder. Mm -hmm. So this number might seem painful, but as you get up in level, you start to find out you're doing more and more things. So, because remember, your level is always added to it. So, and an example here, a third level elf ranger with a 15 wisdom as a primary attribute attempts to track a pair of wily kobolds through a mountain pass. And it, it shows, you can read the book, if you get it. And here are your attribute modifiers. If you guess, somehow managed to get a one, don't even know how you could do that, but if you get a one through some magical means, you get a negative four. And up to 1819 is a positive three. Like this range for 1, 13, 14, and 15. Plus 2 is 16, 17. Plus 3 is 18 and 19. Pretty simple. All right, you ready for classes? Shoot. Okay, let's start with the barbarian. Barbarians live outside the civilized world. Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay, barbarian. Oh, wait, it's, hang on. Uh, let's go to expanding the idea. I want to see the assassin thing. Castle okay. Crusades encourages you to push the boundaries of your imagination to adapt the game to your playing style and make it your own. The nature of the class may evolve and the type of class you want to play as well. Assassins are stealthy and cunning expert killers who have uh, rarely have motives beyond the collection of payment for a job well rendered. Although not always evil, they are typically indifferent to any suffering and pain they cause. See, the way this is written is like assassins have to be in this book, but I hate them. That, that's what's what I'm getting out of this. They aren't heroes. They can't be heroes. Well, Doom Bunny says siege makes DMing so easy. It's castle keeping. Thank you. <laughs> can't throw anything at me. I'm on the internet. And then multi-classing. Multi-classing slash class and a half. Combine the skills with the two classes and one allowing. Okay, this this is like a mix match. Like, I want to be a bard cleric. I, I'm I want to I, I want to be a singing pastor. I'm like, all right. And if it's like the seven uh, the seventh printing, we will we'll have a whole section on that at the end. Super. 
All right. Let's just jump right in. Okay, here are the terms. Prime attribute, hit dice, alignment, weapons, armor, abilities. And there's a chart here. So if you're an assassin, the assassin's on top now. Um, let's look at the barbarian. Barbarian can wear any armor, use any shield, and have any helm. All right. And the cleric as well? Wow, okay. Well, it, it kind of harkens back to the warrior priests of basic D&D. In basic D&D, they can wear anything. Yeah. All right. Barbarian, let's... uh. Let's see, level one, gets a d12 hit die. Pretty good. Yeah, base to hit is plus zero, so it starts at plus zero, so... Wow, so you'd get the base to hit a plus one. Plus, I think we'll find out later when we talk about the rules, but let's guess, plus the strength bonus maybe to hit? Probably. Plus your level? That d20 roll is going to expand pretty quickly. So, because uh, well, the reason why I bring that up is because uh, when we did the old castles in Crusade 7 print, uh, Seventh printing, people said, that looks pretty harsh. That even seems like a high-level character would have some problems. Like, no. No, <laughs> I, I, be, because you add your level into stuff, the higher level you get, the easier everything becomes. So, uh, see, what do you get at first level? Combat sense, plus two bonus to surprise, to surprise checks and halves an attacker's base attack bonus. Wow. Back attack bonus. Yeah, back attack. Yeah, I'm sorry. My fuzzy eyes. Um, deer stalker, outdoor survival skills, determine direction, find shelter and food, climbing and swimming. Huh, I wonder if there's a big survival mechanic. I don't remember that from 7th printing. Maybe there was, and I just don't remember it, but I wonder if there's a big survival mechanic in this one. That, that's a good thing. I am pro-survival mechanic. I know some people call it, it's just a camping simulator then, but I like survival mechanics when, uh, when done well. And yeah, you have to sometimes do camping simulator to get from point A to point B. More people die of dysentery than of trolls, you know, cutting them in half. <laughs> like, that's a bad game. No, it's not a bad game. It's only a bad game when you're spending all your sessions worried about that crap. See, yeah, the 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 problem with that is uh, if if they actually had enough money and they and they prepared properly for this like month long journey, if they did everything right, you know, they they got the you know they they started off on this Oregon Trail and they got an extra axle and and you know they 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 got all the preserved meats and and you know anti scurvy juice or whatever <laughs> they, they got all that juice. together and then they went they're well prepared I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna be cool with them I'm gonna be cool with them but if they're like ah eh, we'll figure it out exit strategy who needs it you know <laughs> we'll just hunt crap on the way then I'm gonna give them a problem. I'm going to like, oh, you got to make rolls now. This is going to get tough. There, there may not be any game today. You know, hunters don't come back every day with food. Sorry. So, yeah, it, it all it all depends on on how prepared the uh, the players are before they embark on a giant journey to, you know, see if I screw with them or not. I don't fully understand this question. Why do you roll 3d6 to get a number just to note them? Oh, so you're thinking that uh, you just worry about the modifier, not worry about the value. A lot of times, because I don't know if this game does it, we'll find out. Uh, a lot of times there are configured stats with that as well. Like Earth Dawn is a perfect example. Like, why do yeah. you have value when everything is literally done off a step? Well, yeah, because... Figured the characteristics, they're like two or more primary attributes. Yeah. Added together, divided by two or added together plus three. It creates a secondary attribute. That is important for your movement rate or how many actions you get per turn or whatever. So that that's why they have value, even though uh, for those stats, the most important part is the modifier. But those stats could be inputted into a different stat then becomes important in a different part of the game. So that's pretty much it. Uh, sorry, trying to get some of the chat on the screen since we're not addressing it directly. By the way, I do really appreciate everybody that's chatting. If we don't get it on the screen, we're not trying to ignore you, but you know we have a we have to present this stuff. So, uh, good traveling camping rules should include possibility of descending to cannibalism. Wow. Well, no, no. If if they you know like oh we're 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 going to the to uh, to Mordor and uh, we're 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 just gonna bring all of our wool stuff. You know, it's fine. It'll be cold on the way there. It's a volcano, sure, but eh. Who cares? Food? Nah, we'll find something on the way. Water? There's rivers everywhere. Those people get into a Dahmer situation, all right? <laughs> a Dahmer situation? Well, I was going to say Lord of the Flies, but okay. <laughs> or uh, what, what was, uh, what's the one everybody uh, uses? Uh, the, the people who traveled west? God dang it. I can't. Yeah. Homesteaders, Oregon Trail. No, no, no. Actually, I think you said the name. I was thinking Jeffrey Dahmer. 
Was that, was oh, that where he... Oh, Donner Party. No, Donner Party. There you go. Donner that, Party. Yeah, a, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, what I said. Yeah, it was the plane crash up in the mountains. And they're like, oh, well, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> it's getting kind of cold. And, Donner, uh, there you go. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you can see the, uh, what the, what do you call it? The Barbarian gets, uh, we're going to scroll past this description. Beyond, beyond the walls of cities and towns and well beyond the bounds of civilization dwell the Barbarians. From windy steps to mountaintops, from deep jungles to arid plains, Barbarians live in freedom a part of the world around them rather than a slave to it. All right. Barbarian characters are fearsome warriors closer to primordial life than are most others. They are fiercely reactive, trusting that only through bold and decisive actions are the fates confounded. All right. And they rely upon individuality. They're, they're, they're your fantasy libertarians. All right. Uh, <laughs> Well, this armor. is important to know. This is important to know because you, when you choose barbarian, just like if you choose elf, you are choosing a way to role play your character. You are choosing this path. No, you are not a barbarian vegan. Get out of here. I'm sorry. <laughs> They're hunter gatherers. You, you can't live on berries alone, numb nut. You're going to have to have some venison, like it or not. So I, I actually want to read these two sentences. Above all else, barbarians value their independence and often maintain their own, own codes or beliefs. Many have died from voicing opposition to tribal leaders, but are respected all the more. They spoke or acted upon their beliefs. Okay. It's just, it, it, I, I like how it you know, just puts that out there. Um, abilities. Uncanny sense for presence of foes, immediate vicinity, we gain plus two in world... Rolling a surprise check against foe. My eyes tearing up. Uh, foes attempting to surprise him. Okay. Deer stalker. So what is this? Uh, able to forage off the land, find shelter, food, and water. And I'm not reading the rest of that. Uh, for themselves. Ah, shh, shh, shh. We're not saying that stupid word. That no, no, does no, no, not. No, no, no. What, what, what I'm, what I, 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 that's yeah. not why I'm doing it. I'm saying it because that's why I didn't read it though. Water for them, but not for the group. You know, like I, I, I can find food and water for me just fine. All right, I'll, I'll read it in English instead of this nonsense talk. Deer stalkers are able to forage off the land, find shelter, food, and water for themselves. Start a fire and determine direction. There we go. That's actually English. Uh, Chris, D six plus two hours. So puts a time frame in there because one of the things I have seen in the past is like, yeah, just roll. Okay, you spend about an hour. <laughs> have you ever been hunting? I don't hunt anymore, but I have been hunting. I never went out for an hour. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're in a tree for a long time. Right. Or, or you're, you're in a duck blind for all day. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not. Uh, can you see if there's any chat to pop up on the screen? Uh, uh, yeah. Running okay. a food cart seems like a natural fit for the area surrounding popular adventuring locales. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, look, <laughs> people used to follow armies, right? Yeah. Why not follow the adventures? Uh, can start a fire in 1d10 minutes by natural means, as long as the needed materials are available. So, okay. Intimidate. Based on constitution. Now, that's interesting. I've seen this based on, like, all types of stats, like charisma and strength, usually. I don't think I've ever seen this based on constitution before. No, I've, I've seen strength or charisma as yep. the main ones, but constitution, just your, your, your raw I health. I've seen it's wisdom slash willpower as well because you're, you're exuding your willpower out, but that's very rare. So let's see what it says then. Barbarians offer an imposing display of ferocious raw power. They instinctively realize that victory lies in the wine besotted soft demeanors of their foes and that brute force works best when combined with overwhelming terror. Okay. Barbar it still doesn't say anything about uh, uh, constitution yet though. Barbarians are able to project themselves as this brutal, terrifying force, whether through sheer force of will or savage decorum. Wouldn't that be wisdom? Do they redefine wisdom in this game? Because usually willpower falls under wisdom. Hmm. While attacking, uh, sorry, while attacking and upon a successful constitution check, any creature of equal or lesser hit dice than the barbarian suffers minus two to all rolls, including but not limited to initiative, attack, damage, and attribute checks. Wow. Okay. I'm not going to read all of this. We're not going to read every class. Okay? I actually w went back and read Constitution. Not only is it overall health, mm -hmm. but it's also your ability to withstand pain, suffer physical damage, avoid fatigue, and fight off sickness and poison. So the big one is to withstand pain. 
Yeah, which is usually kind of a willpower thing. Yeah, uh, and- wisdom, uh, the depth of personal experience, the ability to make well-considered decisions or judgments and represents a spiritual connection to a deity. So it has nothing to do with with willpower, with like mental, mental why fortitude. They call it yep. wisdom. Okay, yeah. that's fair. That's good to know because I, I would honestly, I would put that under wisdom. But now knowing that this game treats it differently, cool. Okay, get it. Oh, we got primeval instincts. Whirlwind attack at fourth level can swing around and act like a fool. Well, uh, it'll look pretty. It'll look like you're a giant yeah. weed whacker going <laughs> going through an army. <laughs> yeah, blood, blood fountains everywhere you go. What is it? The or is isn't that an orc in Warhammer Fantasy that can just do that? Just spin in circles and just, just chop spin. everything yeah! down. Yeah, just, right. yeah, take off everyone's head. All right, ancestral calling. A tenth level barbarian's reputation and prestige allows him. Okay, how about let's read this right? Barbarians. Nope, can't do it. Allows him to call upon others to fight alongside the barbarian with heightened ability. So you can call your spirit family, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, affected creature gains hit points equal to the maximum of one extra hit die for the creature. Wow. For example, an affected fighter would gain additional 10 hit points. Nice. And that's just gross. Why are you eating that? You don't eat the Atiug. And what, what is wrong? What is wrong with you? You don't eat. Th- you're poison. Okay, roll a poison save and again, oh, oh, and a disease save. And <laughs> he's literally standing in the creature's mouth. That's where you don't want to be. He's eating. His, he's biting its top lip. Yeah, that's he's, that's he's kind of sexual. The, the, yeah, the, the top of the top of the creature's jaw and standing on his bottom jaw. You realize he's just got to close on your little halfling ass and you're done, right? <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Um, it just so, as a, yeah, just as a uh, PSA out there. Barbarians, not bright. <laughs> not bright. I, but I, did, I do want to put out for the PSA out there. Do not eat your Atiug. You will die of some sort of dysentery, cholera, pig bird SARS. Ah. All right. Barbarian high level progression abilities, iron sinews, magic falters as the barbarian batters it down with its unbridled power. Yeah, I'm going with it on that one. Uh, the barbarian's constitution bonus compounds the force of his. Bl- oh my God, I can't read this. Uh, we're going to the next one. Constitution bonus of 15th level. Force of nature. Core beliefs are rooted in the animal world where instincts often override reason as seen right here. Yeah, there it is. Oh, <laughs> and uh, we, before you stop the abilities at level 13, a barbarian has the raw power. Where is that? To, uh, to, uh, to uh, strike a, an enemy that can only be affected by magical weapons with a non-magical weapon. Nice. Yes using their constitution score as a fake bonus. If you have a constitution modifier plus one, any non-magic weapon you have is considered to be plus one when it comes to hitting uh, creatures that are immune to certain levels of weapon. Uh, Warlord, the road of adventure brings spoils of many kinds, not the least of which is reputation. At 20th level, barbarian reputation resonates through the many lands of his conquests. If opportunity presents itself, the barbarian can call up an army of 10 to 100 first level barbarians. I'm not sure that if I'm fighting stuff uh, as a 20th level guy, that that's going to help much. But for story purposes, I get. No, because most armies, most standing armies are zero level fools conscripts you know like i was a farmer last week when you're fighting masses with masses yes i agree you wouldn't want to bring this into fight having a hundred leveled you know classed uh fighters against uh you know joe joe schmo farmer and you're probably probably doing okay and for every 20 barbarians there's a one level third lieutenant one level third one level three lieutenant so that's good too a 22nd SR. What's SR? Um, 16th Barbarian gains natural SR. What is SR? Spell resistance? Probably. I wonder if we skip that section that said what SR is. I think it's um, or saving throw. Is this like a saving throw? Can you look that up for me? So I'm not. For, uh, force of nature. Yeah, um, it just says SR. Yeah. It's probably spell resistance. I'm guessing it's some sort of spell resistance slash uh, uh, saving throw. Because that's pretty dark, and it would fit the barbarian class, and that's pretty cool if uh, that's the case. Yeah, I don't think we skipped it. I just think it hasn't described it yet. Mm. 
which is again another problem I have with with uh, with some books where they, they they give you a term and they don't they don't define it for you. Like I mean, we SR can, I can, is a game term, but I have no idea. What spell is yes, the three arc says it's spell resistance. Okay, that was the most likely scenario, yeah. but hey, you know. I want to be I want to be accurate in that regard. So. All right, let's move on to the Bard. Uh, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the classes. This is kind of an overview. This isn't a read everything word for word. It's to show you what's in the game. Uh, but we'll talk about some of the stuff that we think is interesting or that catches our eye or skip all the important parts. I don't know. Uh, Bards, obviously charisma. Hit die 10. That's different. I didn't see that one coming. Yeah, I wonder if that was in 7th edition. We just don't remember. Uh, alignment any. Weapons, it's got a list of weapons, armor, and abilities. Decipher script, exalt, legend, lore, fascinate, and exalt greatness. Kind of reminds me of the Troubadour from Earthdawn. Drink. Um, all right, decipher script, uh, decipher unfamiliar writing. That's a pretty standard thiefish, roguish ability in a lot of old school games. Yep. Inspire companions, plus two to any one attribute check. So now you got that d20. You've got your level added in. You've got your attribute modifier added in. And now you've got the bard helping you out. Yep. You can so. do it. I can do it. <laughs> it's that simple. <laughs> it's that simple. <laughs> Fascinate two creatures three times. Two creatures. So does this game define creatures weirdly? Like as in anything? Like a, a bat? Or is creature? does it have a specific meaning? I don't like it when games create too many specific meetings well a creature is different than a monster which is different than undead which is different than a, than an animal which is different than a, i was like okay that's that's too many yeah. definitions to me a creature is a non-player character class uh, i'm sorry a, a, a non-player character race i i look at this creature character race is a creature a monster is a subset of all creatures an undead is a subset of monster which is a subset of all creatures mm -hmm. that that's pretty much the way i see it as well yeah Charm. So, so if, can you fascinate a bat? That'd be great. Three times per day. Yes, you can. Hey, but that's cool because that kind of gives the bard, you know, that kind of magic. It's not just sitting there strumming songs. He's like, hold on here. I can do a little bit of crowd control for you. I like that. Okay. Description. Oh. Fascinate. Hang on. I want to, I want to answer that question right now. Creatures to be fascinating must be able to see and hear the bard, and the bard must also see the creature. The creatures must be able to pay attention to the bard. The distraction of nearby combat or other danger will prevent the ability from working. The bard can use music, poetry, chanting, speech, uh, flashing, whatever, to, to get it done. Uh, when a bard uses the ability, the target makes a charisma saving throw to resist the bard's spell song. If the saving throw fails, the creature sits quietly and listens to the bard for up to the full duration of the effect. While using this ability, the bard must concentrate as if casting and, and maintaining a spell. While fascinated, the target is a creature is prone to suffer minus four penalty to all saving throws and minus five to armor class. It doesn't give a definition anywhere of what a creature is. From the description of that, it sounds like it that has to be able to see and hear you, understand you to some extent, and has to have a and has to be able to make a charisma saving throw. So it sounds like it sounds like that has to be an intelligent creature. I mean, I would. So as a ruling uh, point of fact, yeah, I would make it has to be some. I would even say, depending on how you're doing it, it has to be something that understands you. Now, if you say, well, I'm just playing music. OK, it's got to be something that understands music like your cat and dog aren't going to be fascinated by the fact that you're, you know, strumming your lute or tooting your horn. Um but that's that's how I would handle that personally. But I would want to make sure that the power is more broad rather than more restricted. Otherwise, why are you playing a bard, right? Actually, you know what? If if you wanted to make it as broad as possible, you can just say, can it hear you? Can it see you? Yes, yes. Does it have a charisma check? Yes. All right. Fair. Then you can do it. Yep. That that's a, that's a fair way to handle it. Yeah. All right. Every age and people has a voice. That voice finds its measure in story, expressed in legend tales, song, poem, battle cry, or speech. From wild barren steppes to the frozen lands at the tips of the world, from taverns to town squares, and from city streets to imperial residences, there are those blessed with the ability to artfully weave story and legend. Why wow, is this not sounding like the troubadour from Earth Dawn? A little bit, yeah. Way more than the bard from D&D. &D. Oh, yeah. Well, well, after first edition, anyway. First edition bards, we get our different, but... 
Um, da -da -da, where was I? Uh, our fleet we started led moving to the heart. Oh, moving the hearts to great feats. I don't want to read all that, but you get the idea of what the bard is. Bards can yep. lead by example or deed, but they're uh, bards can lead by example or deed, but they primarily influence others with story, art, or argument. Ah, oh, great! It's the debate team. <laughs> The skill of recitation borders on the magical. <clears throat> so much so that they're often able to charm listeners with their tales. Great. Purpose. Possess artistic skills that are needed to convince an audience that what they see is more than what is shown. They gain access to various strata of society. Uh, yeah, they gain access to the various strata of society, both low and high, walking among them to acquire knowledge and power. I, I like the sound of the bard so far. It doesn't sound yeah. like... I play songs and buff you. No, you have a purpose. The bard's role as a historian and storyteller. I'm telling you, this is the troubadour from Earth Dawn. This is the one thing yeah. I really thought that Earth Dawn got right. Drink, drink, drink. Um, but yes, and, and I like the way it's written here. Now, we may have said this back in, at the, in a, with our seventh edition. I don't remember. <laughs> like, like, to be fair, I don't remember. But I like this. This is good stuff. Must be free of mind and spirit so they probably go along well with the um barbarian just uh sure. i'm a i'm a skull not a bard <laughs> all right uh known to inspire others to greater deeds as we already talked about abilities decipher script based on intelligence bards often need to decipher and interpret legends and secret writings to acquire more knowledge that's why you bring them wrong that's the whole point of a historian that's yep. it's not that bards do it because oh i have to know multiple languages because i don't know no there's a reason for it it's the historian Exalt. This is the bard's ability to inspire companions and listeners, allowing the bard to surpass his normal level of performance. Some bards invoke this ability through song and music, while others do so through oration. Battle cries or sheer acting. My, uh, can you read that? My eye is starting yeah, okay. to... With a successful attribute check, a bard can help allies succeed at a task. There we the go. The ally gets a plus two bonus on any action requiring an attribute check, including class ability checks, saving throws, and standard attribute checks. This ability does not affect attack rolls. The All allies right. must be able to see and hear the bard and must be within 60 feet. The castle keeper may rule that certain uses of this ability are infeasible. The bard can use this ability once per day, per level, and can maintain the effect for a number of rounds equal to the bard's level. The bard can take other actions while using this ability unless the castle keeper rules otherwise. As the bard rises in level, the bonus imparted increases as well. At 6th level, you get plus 3. At 12th level, you get plus Oops. 4. And at 18th level, you get plus 5. All right, so... Apparently, we uh, skipped the bard with the 7th printing. <laughs> we did? I guess so. That's oh, okay. what he said. All right. But uh, so this whole exalt thing, anything but attack rolls that that's important. Because unlike unlike other bards and other games where they're only just, you know, buff machines for for combat, they they literally can't buff for combat. They buff for everything else. Saving throws. Maybe you, you, you can argue that's part of combat. That's fine. All right, let's uh, let's move on to legend lore. With successful attribute check: a bard gains or remembers some relevant information about local notables, a legendary item, noteworthy place, or other relevant bit of information. So, typical legend lore. Um, check will not reveal the powers of a magic item, but may give a hint to its history. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, if if if, uh, if you have a a sword that has a has a phoenix on it. And it has fire engravings, and the the bard the bard know. Oh, I heard about that sword. Yeah, it was it was uh, made in the hottest uh, part of uh, part of the world by eighteen dragons, and they, they all breathe fire on it. I'm 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 sure it has ice abilities. No, you you pretty much got you know. Like, okay, well the the backstory and the art on the thing tells me this thing is some kind of flame weapon. All right, I figured okay. it out. Thanks. And you can see the powers here. And again, I probably, if you want us to read through all of these, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> like, you get the game. I think you can still, I mean, it's not backing it, but I think you can uh, still buy it. Uh, if not, you'll be able to buy it soon once they get all, the, all of us backers, our hard copies. So. Uh, you can go to trollordgames.com and uh, check it out there. Oh, Indigo Dragon says the Bard class is his least favorite. Well, we've only gone through two, and the apparent synergy between Barbarian and Bard is really high up there. I mean, uh, a uh, a bard has lots of hit points and 
uh, up, up to a certain level is just as good as a fighter in combat, the barbarian is going to appreciate that, is going to respect that. And they, they, they both love the idea of freedom, individuality, and charting your own course. They, they're going to synergize on that one too. So, you know, having a, having a group of, with, with a bard and a barbarian, and it seems like a good fit at the moment. So uh, he's talking back and forth with Chris Black and I think uh, uh, maybe Aaron also. Um, but I, I, I'm guessing this is more of a general uh, co uh, comment. Because to be fair, I don't really like bards in most games either. This one isn't, isn't bad. This one isn't bad? No, it's got uh, a just lot like, of good flavor to it. I, I keep mentioning it, but just like the Earth Dawn Troubadour isn't bad. Because they both serve a role as the historian. Not just a stupid buff bot. But as right. hold on, I can help you. And that's why I put up what uh, Three Arcs said, and I'll put it up again. Legend lore is amazingly useful. Clerics have, the pos have possible divine, and wizards have possible arcane knowledge. But bards can figure out lore, rumors, information the best. That's... Right. Yeah. Okay. If you were to make an investigative type character, you'd make it out of a bard. So, Sway Crowd at 13th level. Uh, what was it a motion song? No. <laughs> so you can uh, influence others. So that's awesome when you spin your tails at 15th level uh the bard's mastery of his abilities and his uh, recitations of wonders increase his charisma by one point that was a really hard sentence to read morons um word of power at 17th level the bard's ability of song and music allows him to wound okay i'm gonna say that there yeah, whatever i'm not reading to that crap wound anymore a creature once a day by sending forth a word of power oh it's the uh it's the original dune movie <laughs> It's like you played that note such a dissonance that ow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if no. you're level four or less, you just die. You just die. Yep. Twelve or <laughs> more, you turn deaf. That's the best outcome. <laughs> that, well, hey, that hey, what that bard said was so horrific. I'm like, no, 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 la 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 la. <laughs> Uh, change alignment at twenty second level. The bard can target and change the alignment of any non player character. What? Target must be willing to listen, and the process takes time. Okay, now now the bard's starting to sound like a supervillain or a cult. <laughs> I know, right? It's mean, starting to get weird now. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. Come, come on, come on, sit, sit down. Let me tell you about Scientology. <laughs> oh, God. This process goes on for as many months as the bard wishes to continue, uh, continue altering the target's alignment. Wow. Wow. Don't okay. worry, I'm going to make you clear. <laughs> i can see clearly now the bard has spoken all right um and we get up to level 24 in here and you can see all the abilities good stuff i don't know what you're reaching for but okay the cleric how many of these do we want to do today these classes should you do two more Oh, hang on. Uh, Three Arc says, wow, I think that the plus one charisma at 15th level is the only instance in this game you can increase a stat without magic item or spell. I don't know if it's the first one we saw so far. I mean, the, the Barbarian special high-level ability was spell resistance, and yeah. it seems like the, the, the Bard's special ability is get a plus one in charisma because they're using it all the time. I mean, at, at, at higher level, they're, they're, you know, cult leaders and stuff, so they need a higher charisma. <laughs> We'll, we'll see what the cleric gets. Tell that to my wife. Oh, Noro. <laughs> Somebody said I can sing. <laughs> You've never seen me drunk sing. Uh, right. Look, right there. Right there. Somebody said I can sing. All right, let's move on. <laughs> She's trying to throw a shoe at me. Okay. And she threw a shoe at me. Um, where are we here? Uh, do do, do we? Yeah, well, how many more do we want to do? We're, we're gonna do click re really quick. I'll do it. Okay. okay. Prime attribute wisdom. It's not a surprise to anyone. Hit <laughs> dies D8. That's not a surprise. I'm a little shocked the bard's got a D10, but a D8 for a cleric. I'm not shocked. Alignment any again. Not shocked. Uh, weapons. It looks like it's all uh, blunt, which you know that's that's not uncommon. Any armor. Special ability spell use. Obviously. Uh, the the more wisdom you have. The more the more spells you can do per day seems fair. Turn undead again, nice weapon selection. Cleric must wield the weapon of their of their deity. That's why the 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 weapons are all blunt. But you also 
have special. If you look under there, the first one is special. That means if your deity tells you you're going to use knives, you're using you knives. Use knives. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you, God. May I have another? And then you just use knives all day. Or no, no, you can only use slingshots. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, God. You really want me dead, but all right. Well, no, I want you to stand in the back and let other people get dead. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Archetype. <laughs> okay. Here, here's where the rubber meets the road here. Clerics are warrior priests. They are religious by nature and can be found in service to a pantheon of deities or eternally bound to serve only one. From their deity or deities, the cleric receives divine powers and act as conduits of that power of their deity upon the planes of men. Yet these powers come at a high cost in service, devotion, and loyalty. A cleric's divine connection to a deity is of supreme importance. This spiritual connection allows them to better understand the motives and will of their deity and to more capably and earnestly enact the deity's desire. Okay, from that sentence, I can infer that the most important thing in the cleric's life is their deity. If it means breaking a commandment of their God or watching all of you die, this dude's going to get popcorn. Watch all of you die rather than break a commandment from their God to, to save your life. I don't care who you are, what you are. That's what that paragraph says to me. And I like that because if you are, if you are so religious that God is giving you superpowers, you have to be a zealot. Doesn't um, DCC do something like that? Like uh, if your character doesn't follow the cleric's religion, you get healed less or something? Yeah, yeah. You, they, you have you have minuses. You get... Uh, uh, I, I'm know, absolutely... For, I'm 100% yeah, for that. 100%. Uh, deities are from any ethos, from good to evil. doesn't matter. Lawful, chaotic. You, you, you get to choose your god. You, you, no one no one wants to play a cleric where where the where the dungeon master is like, oh, we're gonna randomly roll your god now. No, well, uh, no, no, you're not. No, you're not. So that's nice. Uh weapons and armor, abilities, spells. We got that. And you got a spell list down here. So one thing we to note is that level spells and one first. Well, we'll look at what zero level spells yeah, are yeah, later. The cantrip level type yeah. spells. I, I remember we talked about that in the past uh, yeah. with seventh. But uh, clerics can start casting at first level. Some of you old school D and D players are like, clerics can't cast spells to start. Well, here they can. Yeah. And spells also go to ninth level for consistency's sake. I think uh, because you know in D and D clerics only get to seventh level, but mages right. get to ninth level, and some people get confused. I don't know why they're confused, but still. Um, but for consistency's sake. Clerics also go through ninth level. Right. And then the, the, the special abilities, bonus spells, you've, you have a, it's based on basically it's your, your, the modifier range. It's he, man. Plus one, plus two, plus three. That's how many extra spells you get. And uh, turning undead. If you're a good, if you're a good aligned cleric with a, you know, a, a god of good or whatever, you, you can only turn undead. But if you are an evil cleric, you can turn or control. That's important. Weapon selection. Here, here's where it's going to define it. The cleric is only allowed to use certain weapons. They can, if they choose, pick a weapon off the list that is identical to the major weapon in use by the deity which they worship. If no single deity is worshipped and a pantheon is instead worshipped, weapon selection is limited to the pantheon's major deities or the deity most closely associated with the activities the cleric intends to undertake. Wow, that is too confusing. That's too much for the player to handle. What that told me was that if you do not, if, if you worship a specific deity, <clears throat> you must take the weapon the deity says you get. I get that. That's fair. I respect it. But if you respect, if you worship a pantheon and not one specific God, you have to choose your weapon based on what you're going to do that day? Well, no, it says if no single deity is worshipped in a pantheon, it says it works with weapon selection is limited to the pantheon's major deities or the or, deity most closely associated with, oh, the activity, yeah, okay, yeah. Exactly. So you, you're you like, oh, no, I, I'm I'm going to raid a village today. I I can't use my, my, my trusty Warhammer. I have to use this flail that's been gathering dust because in my pantheon, the god of pillaging says I got to use a flail. Like what? That's dumb. Yeah, my um, 
so this goes to one of those things again this is just a personal thing with me when i run games and whatnot i i always associate so we're talking dungeons and dragons now specifically second edition because it's where i have the most experience um i always treated clerics as worshiping pantheons but alignment pantheons you know, you, you weren't uh, worshiping set and raw at the same time no no you respected one or the other but you worshiped either the good side or the bad side whatever depending on your alignment right yeah see I, priest, would, I, I would i would have to make it easier pick a god well that's priests that's how i run priests if you're especially yeah, priest then you pick a god there is no priest in there there's just cleric so you're I, no 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 i get I'm, I'm just yeah. i'm going back and say there in this game I would say the same thing. I'd say you pick a God there. We're not doing this pantheon thing. Pick a God. No, no. You can respect the other ones, but you, you know, you're not worshiping every one of them. One of them's your favorite. Pick one. <laughs> one of them's your guy. Uh, wisdom bonus. Ah, 15th level of clerics power in their order of proven to chosen devotion. DT increases their wisdom by one point. So it looks like 15th level is where you get the special stuff. The barbarian got spell resistance, the bard got extra charisma, and the, the cleric gets extra wisdom. Well, the chat's moving pretty quickly here. Uh, looks like that's going to be a pattern. So he does a uh, favorite weapon from Greyhawk. Always found the weapon restriction thing to be ridiculous. Fighters already get a uh, better hit bonus. Well, I mean, it... it uh, <laughs> I, I get what you're saying conceptually, but I think what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to be know your role. No, plus it, it's also a symbol of your devotion to your God. Sure. That, that you will only use, use the weapon that, that your God approves of or prefers or whatever. Right. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an added part of your devotion. You are, you, you, you know, if it comes between your wife and your God, you're going to pick your God every time and twice on Sunday. Chimerians so, had much better players than we've had in our games. <laughs> I joke, but only partially. Uh. <laughs> I, the idea I would love to see it because I was listening to Chimerian talk on uh, with Bruce the other day. I, I would love to, you and him being in the same room. Ooh, actually, you guys have a lot of similar beliefs. I think just the way you implement them is different. Uh, Holy campaign. Oh, Jesus. Here we go. Here comes the Crusades. Once a cleric right. gains 18th level, they can call for a holy campaign. For each follower the cleric has, they can raise 1 to 10 armed adherents with a D8 hit die and gather a further 1 to 100 unarmed adherents with D4 hit die to also follow them on whatever campaign they deem important. So you get a high enough level, you, you can call a jihad and just roll over that town. They have, they, they, they have offended my god. We're, we're going to war and you can just do that well it's That's gonna be great. your jihad versus my crusade there you go uh the higher level you get the the better you are at the at calling folk for the holy crusade that's good uh this, perfect uh, recall uh-oh at 20th what? level clerics can recall any previously class zero level cleric spells at will they must make a successful wisdom check with a cl zero to recall and cast the spell, and they only recall a specific spell once that day. For instance, a cleric who successfully recalls an, an Endure Element spell cast earlier may only recall it for one additional casting that day. At 24th level, clerics can also recall any previously cast first level spell at will. They must make a successful wisdom check with a zero level spell. Okay. So, so I, I got to butt in here because this is just really annoying to me. This is my editor coming out again. Why do you have up here a cleric gains, blah, 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 right? And then right in the next section, you have clerics. <laughs> Fucking consistency. Go on. Okay. So, uh, they oh, and now the, here's the cleric. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we got all, we got all three now, but, uh, it looks like, uh, when you get to 20th level, the whole, uh, number of spells per day is more of a guideline than a rule. At that point, <laughs> well, you are pretty powerful. <laughs> let's be fair. Yeah, and then banish, uh, this banish is... extra planar creatures as a special ability. You know, usually you have a spell for that, but well, in the ability. in the original versions of Dungeons and Dragons, it wasn't just turn undead. You were turning demons, also. Okay, then there you go. It's a good deal. Twenty uh, second level divine monolith. 
uh, paragon. You're such a paragon of the deity an that aura of, <laughs> an aura of holy or unholy energy. Magic circle. Clear. Wow. Wow. A magic circle, 20 foot radius that does the following. Cleric is immune to all death attacks, including by limited to by spell, item, class, ability, or poison. The cleric gains plus three to all turn undead checks within radius of the divine monolith. The cleric gains plus two to all attribute checks and saves. The spell like ability cannot be dispelled or dismissed, and it is a permanent duration. Basically, just you're an avatar. <laughs> you're walking around, wow. you're an avatar. <clears throat> Uh, for a second, I was like, why is the hammer coming out of this character's head? Oh, but she's she's holding on to it right yeah, there. She got two hammers. She, she, she's double fisting hammers today. Mark of the Saint. The cleric's order sector deity recognizes them as a saint, no matter the cleric's alignment. The cleric's word becomes law to the faithful. Lower ranking members of the order flock to the saint side. The saint gains 1d10 followers per point of with What? Wait, per point of wisdom or yeah. wisdom bonus? No! Wow! Four point of wisdom. And they got a plus one at 50th level. <laughs> wow. For every 10 followers you get, you get a first level cleric that comes. If you have 40 followers, you get a fourth level cleric. If you have 80, you get an eighth. If you have a hundred, you get 10. If you roll really well, you can have a 10 wisdom, a 10 wisdom. And oh, I just rolled all tens. And you have an army of the willing. <laughs> just uh, just like where whoever but you consider want the level on. of the character and what you're going to be doing at that level you're, yeah, you're not at just that level you are yeah. you are changing the landscape and they're giving you the bodies to do it yep and you and you should be at that level if you're 23rd level hey <laughs> you know. yeah you're you're up there i get it i get it all right um, how, how many character classes are there? 13? 12. Let's do um, 12 yeah, plus let's assassin. Go let, let's, let's go through six. I know we the, like, so next week we'll do the second half of the character classes. So okay. we've done what, three so far? Yep. All right, so let's do three more. Let's see if we can whip through these. All right, we'll do them in a row so we don't forget. You want me to do it or do you want to do it? My eye is still a little weird, but I can read okay, now. Let me, let, me, let me do Druid. Okay. okay, again, the prime attribute... I have a problem with Druid. I never liked it. I'm the opposite. I've always loved Druids. I, I get it. I get it. But when, when you already have a cleric or a priest, you know, it's it's kind of like uh, ice cream and sherbet, you know, be ice cream or be nothing. You know, what's wrong with you? If I remember correctly, though, when we talked about Druids last time, I thought that they were actually in this game decidedly different than clerics. Okay, well, number one, they have to be any neutral alignment. Uh, bows, clubs, daggers for weapons. Armor is very restricted. That's fine. Spell use, they and it's exactly the same as the cleric. Uh, bonus languages, they speak druidic language. So that's a useless language unless you're around other druids. Nature lore, find shelter or forage for food and identify species of plant and animal. Okay, so that's a little like the the vegetarian version of the barbarian's ability. So that's fine. It, but this is one of those things where I look at it. If you're doing Dungeons and Dragons, I'm like, who cares? But if you're doing Forbidden Lands, well, there's a survival mechanic built into the game. Exploration requires you to pick what you're doing to uh, to stay fed, to find yep. shelter. If this game does the same thing, then this is amazing. And I love it. If it's just like, yeah, 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 you can roleplay it if you want. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. These people in chat know a lot more about the game than we do, which is awesome. So somebody can put in chat like, oh, yeah, there's a survival mechanic or shut up, Max. You're just being a hater. I don't know. Funny. She didn't look Jewish. That was a good one. Ah. All right. Uh, archetype. <laughs> Druids seek to protect the wilderness and its beasts from the encroachments of civilization, lest the order of the natural world be upset. They find the myriad artificial creations of civilized peoples abhorrent where they believe that reliance upon the unnatural creates people who are weak and dependent upon material culture. They are fiercely individualistic and are often found among the barbarian peoples of the world. Well, there See, you go. I, okay. I already hate it. <laughs> okay. I already hate it. I already hate it. What, what Why is that? Because especially a human Druid is, uh, is a betrayer of their own race. Basically you're, you're a race traitor. Because uh, people 
humans especially need to build weapons, need to build houses to protect them from the elements. They don't have fur. They don't have claws. They, they, they don't have horns. They, they can't run 60 miles an hour is sprinting. They, they, they need ballistae. They need all this stuff. Oh, but a druid hates it. It's unnatural. Well, then all humans would have died a long time ago if we weren't allowed to, to create civilization. So shut your goddamn hole and get your head out of your ass. Just want you to live a little bit more natural life. Stop Thank being for- stop being a virus on the planet and learn to live with nature a little bit. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Purpose. Druids live in harmony with nature, revering, rever- revering its power and beauty. Although they are sometimes termed priests of nature, the druid is much more. No, they're probably also hippies too. They allow <laughs> nature to determine the fate of its creatures for good or ill. Some druids revere nature and its elements alone. Some pr- promote the beliefs of one or more nature's deities. And some bind their anim- the anim- animistic faith to a strict code of personal conduct. All are devoted to their life's calling and p- possess specialized wilderness lore, including knowledge of the animal and plant kingdoms. Their divine dispensations are gifts from the spirits of the wood, walk, rock, water, and wind. Storms rage across the plains, seas thunder against coasts, and the grasses of the wild steppe wave ceaselessly. None knows a motive. Druids must be able to relate to this balance of and neutrality in nature. From this closeness to the surroundings, Druids possess specialized knowledge of wilderness environments, particularly those in which the Druid lives or was trained. Should a Druid cease to revere nature or ignores their code, the wrath and fear of the spirits of the wild descend upon the errant Druid in vengeance. Thank, thank you for leaving that vague. Well, it should, it should be open-minded. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's for the Game uh, Master to decide. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm reading a lot of the chat while you're reading that stuff. Let's skip. Uh, again, we don't have to read everything here. Yeah, so the nature we- or we already explained that pretty well. Well, uh, well what wep- weapons are just natural. Yep. Uh, armor, natural. So there you go. There's your druid. That Boom. stick is going to do a lot of damage to a whole bunch of nothing. <laughs> well, at, at second level, they all get resist elements. You get a plus two bonus to saving throws versus all of the natural elements. See, that's why you don't want civilization, because you can learn how to walk uh, on hot coals and survive yeah, the cold. <laughs> Woodland stride. At third level, you get the ability to move through natural thorns, briars, overgrown areas, and similar terrain at normal speed. Okay. With bare feet? Sure. <laughs> Totem shape. At sixth level, druids gain the spell-like ability to change into a smaller, medium-sized animal and back again once per day. This ability operates like the polymorph self-spell. Upon attaining this ability, the druid must choose a, excuse me, a totem shape. The selection is permanent and cannot be changed. Each time a druid uses this ability, the character regains 1d4 hit. So it's not a complete heal. <laughs> it's just no. 1d4. And it's only once per day. At level 7 and 8, the druid gains a new totem shape. At level 12, uh, the druid uh, takes the ability to change the shape to large version of one mm-hmm. of the previously chosen totem forms. This large form can be assumed once per day, and the druid can decide between the three forms each time the ability is used. When assuming the large version, the druid heals 5d8 hit points. At 15th level, the druid can take a totem shape twice per day. At 18th level, three times per day. Okay, so you get more choices and you can do it more times per day as you go a level and it's a little minor heal. That's fine. Okay. So perhaps you can see them as instead trying to push sustainable living, killing only when needed, not for sport, not clear cutting, not building more than you need. Yeah, this is how I see druids. Yeah. Um, I See, heathen dog sees them as elves. So, you know, they're, again, that's why he thinks the race trader thing, you know, the Earth Liberation Front. Uh, advanced resist elements at level 13 18 and 23 they get bonuses uh wisdom bonus 15th level oh, let me scroll down to that all Plus right one wisdom at 15th level dismiss woodland creatures at 18th level <laughs> just charisma. get away from me go, go. now you've been That's dismissed <laughs> uh let's see perfect recall at 20th level why i don't it's same thing zero zero level druid spell same thing the clerics got okay got it uh elementary mastery 20th level confers see they should have called this one of the elements they should have called this elephant recall Eh? there you go Eh? (laughs) Eh? now you're thinking 
All right. Uh, language of the Wilderlands. At 21st level, Druids master the language of all birds, beasts, trees, and growing things. Okay. You can talk to plants now. All right. Good for you. <laughs> I am Groot. Oh, he says hi. What? <laughs> all right. That's fine. Awaken woodland spirit. At 24th level, you can go, hey, hey, uh, big tree. Come on out. Oh, tree. Uh, Druids can awaken both flora and fauna, making them aware of the greater world around them. And then, and then, the, and then the plants like on par with humans. Yeah, the plants like, no, put me back. I didn't want this. I don't want this. It was so scary. Hurts. Yeah. <laughs> I can't move, and now I know that shit's going to eat me. <laughs> Dead is better. All right. Uh, da, da, da. Awakened I, 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 plants are empowered, their newfound knowledge granting them strength and endurance beyond their normal ken. Hold on a second here. I don't I, beings receive two additional hit die. Okay. I, are you talking to us? You know, because we're partially having fun here. Um, yeah, I, I, as far as clerics go, and somebody who studied a lot of religions outside of even Christianity, I have a pretty good understanding of how clerics work. <laughs> Like, uh, as far as Druids go, uh, again, I've studied a lot of the occult. I've actually studied real Druidism, everything from the nonsense of Wicca to actual real Druidism. So, I mean, I understand it's historical context if you're talking to us, um, but we're also having fun with our, you know, our presentation here too. Yeah. Now, if you're talking to somebody in chat, well, then I missed it. And I apologize for assuming you were talking about me. <laughs> right. Rocket Raccoon confirmed for 21st level <laughs> Druid. Yeah, that's actually true. He he apparently can understand Groot. There you <laughs> go. Uh, okay, and that that's basically it. Now, I, see, I like the Druid. To yeah, be honest with you, I... I, I you know, be ice cream or be nothing. <laughs> Whatever. See, I... I I like the fact that it doesn't force this balance, this neutrality balance that I think was just a mistyping. Yes, yes. Anything the idea of, of true, new, true neutral is just... an idiot's journey i think just stupid. right but living in harmony with nature and yeah. utilizing nature to its strengths and let's be let's be give and take yeah and then let's be honest animals have alpha creatures alpha males or you know, some animals are pack animals so, yeah. yep and so i mean there's just I, I think the sustainable living thing was the best generic way of putting it and that's one of the reasons why i do like the druid class because as far as like the powers go now if you're just talking powers in the game sure i can walk through trees and you know i can make uh plants talk to me whatever but uh if you actually utilize that in in a methodology of information gathering and you utilize that for hey how can we grow more uh, to to seed this community that somebody's building over there instead of having them you know uh, just lay waste everything uh what's that my strip mine everything you know yeah. I, I absolutely can see how that's built into a society fighter we got two more this one and one more okay part attribute not a shock strength <laughs> alignment any but i want to be a dexterity d10. fighter no hang on hang on hit dice d10 now, same as the when, bard <laughs> i know right when 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 you tell a fighter who's never played this game before yeah you have the same starting hit die as a bard they're like what <laughs> they're gonna lose their they're gonna lose their minds <laughs> it's funny any weapons any armor uh, level one, choose one weapon to specialize uh, specialize in. Plus one bonus to hit and plus one to damage when you're using this weapon. Okay. And one of the things, if you've noticed so far, because I don't think any of the other classes got it, it has a, a base to hit, a plus one starting at first level. The other ones had a zero at first level, if I remember correctly. Okay. And Bruce, uh, no. Uh, you, you can actually use your whole uh, bring, bring uh, plants to consciousness to fight for you. Yeah, D12 so. is a barbarian, yep. Archetype. The fighter is the archetypal warrior, superior to all other classes in armed combat. Fighters come from every geographic region and occupy all social strata. They are born with the strength of will and spirit that leads them to seek the field of battle. They find the clash of metal and the ring of steel invigorating at times and necessary at others. Fighters do not live in fear of the melee. They face their foes with gritted teeth and steely determination longingly anticipating the next test of their strength and skill. All fighters, regardless of background, are characterized by the will and ability to use their brute strength and swift sword to solve problems or overcome foes. Fighters are a unique breed and make their own way in the world for ill or good. 
Okay. Um, just for three arcs, there are way too many gods in Forgotten Realms. I don't like Forgotten Realms gods. <laughs> there are just too many of them. And uh, my most recent AD&D 2nd Edition game, I was playing a Priest of Lyra. But, uh, God, just to go over it. And I'm still upset that Merkel's dead. So until, you know, he unkills Merkel and forgets all that Syric nonsense. <laughs> okay. Any weapons, any armor, that's fine. We weapon specialization, we already got that. Uh, they get another one at 6th level. And at 7th level and at 19th level. Actually, no, uh, they, they get they get a second weapon at 6th level, and then at 7th level, you get, instead of plus 1 bonus, plus 2, and at 19th level, instead of plus 2, you now get a plus 3 to these weapons. Combat dominance. That sounds cool. Sorry, I'm not scrolling down. I'm still extra doing... Extra attack with any weapon when fighting opponents with one hit die or less. So if you're a scrub and, and, you, and you're fighting a 4th level fighter, he is going to just wipe the floor with you. Again, this harkens back to basic Dungeons and Dragons. Now, this is a little bit different than how it worked there, but basic Dungeons and Dragons gave you extra attack on, on creatures of one hit die or less. Yeah, and it goes up at 8th uh, level and 12th level. Yeah, this just adds a couple extra attacks. So at 8th level, yeah. fighters allowed a total of 3 attacks. Yeah, yeah and at 10th at level, you get a general extra attack. <laughs> which is nice. But it does break. not, but but the, the important part is it does not combine with combat dominance. No. Battle space. At 13th level, fighters gain greater control over their battle space. Through, uh, does that sound too PC to you? Wait, okay. Uh, my uh, personal uh, battle space. Wait, wait, wait where, where we look at battle space? Uh, at level? level? Pressure. Right here? I'm looking at it right now. Battle space, yeah. Um, yeah. Fighters gain greater control over their battle space through the use of peripheral vision, anticipation, of their rivals' maneuvers, and no, this seems fine. I mean, no, well, I don't. I, I, I understand, but I it just said battle calling it battle space just sounds stupid. I don't know. I, it doesn't doesn't bother me. <laughs> okay, just the the term could be better. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Uh, experienced fighters develop a keen, almost instinctive understanding of their. Hmm. This allows fighters to coordinate their own defensive and offensive actions in such a way as if they carry a second weapon, use a shield, or even use something as simple as a chair leg, they can use it defensively without it affecting the use of their primary weapon. This grants fighters a plus one bonus to their AC. The bonus does not apply if the fighter is using any two-handed weapon, such as polearm, bow, okay. uh, crossbow, etc. It does combine with a shield bonus, so use of a shield and battle space would grant an extra two to your AC, one for the shield and one for the ability. Like something like combat awareness or 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 battlefield of uh something would have been better than battle space. It just eh. At 17th level, I mean, I like the power. Actually, actually no, 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 Chimerian hits uh, hits the zone, uh, hits uh, hits it on the head here with zone of control. That's actually, I think, a more common term is area of control or zone of control right. over battle space. I I don't have a problem with battle space at all, but now putting those to, uh, together, I would rather have zone of control, yes. Situational control. I would, I would go for that too. Uh, at 17th level, the fighters control of their situation increases allowing them to better master combat maneuvers they gain the following bonuses dodge plus three disengage minus one evade plus five flank plus two rear attack plus two at 22nd level it gets even better so they just uh, it's it's just an uh, uh an extension of their battle experience like you don't know exactly what's going to happen but your experience tells you you better cover your flank at this moment and you get bonuses to the appropriate thing Advanced weapon specialization. At 13th level, the fighter chooses another weapon. We, we already went through that. Mm -hmm. uh, shield blow. At 14th level, you can employ a meat. You can be Captain America. <laughs> Combining the weight of the shield with their skill, they can strike an opponent with the shield. Upon successful strike, the victim suffers a D6 points of damage with a large shield or a D4 with a medium. The shield does not count as a second weapon. Therefore, the fighter does not suffer hit penalties when using the shield. Oh, nice. Weapon so it's actually an extra attack. Okay. But but when it's used offensively, it does not confer its AC bonus. Well, that that makes sense. I think Earth Dawn does the same thing, doesn't it? Yeah. This ability is in addition to the fighter's extra attack ability gained at 10th level. Wow. So a a mid level fighter is a force to be reckoned with, as as he should be. Yes. Strength bonus up oh, 15 plus one strength. 
Seen so, it? so it looks like everybody gets something at yeah. uh, 15th level. Yeah, 15th level. Everyone can get something. Okay. Advanced combat dominance. Same as a fourth level ability, except at 16th level, if you're two hit die creature or less, you're a, sh you're a schlub. Oh my God. People getting too picky now. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Our show is part entertainment. <laughs> Attribute bonus. At 19th level, the fighter gains a point in either strength or dex. <laughs> you can have plus two strength. At 19th level, you can have a 20 strength. Not that you really matter. You're not going to get well, the bonus for it. But... Wait, where, where do you get the other bonus? 15th level, you get a plus one strength. At 19th level, you get a plus one strength or dex. Oh, yeah, you, you, you're right. You're right. Okay, you're right. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So that's wow. That is I'm so, sorry, I'm spending more time looking at chat than listening to what you're saying. Oh, so we have to end it on the somebody already already mentioned this. All right, let's look at Heathen Dog's favorite class from seventh edition. By favorite, I mean he loved it so much he hugged it and squeezed it and named it George. Yep. Illusionist, prime attribute, intelligence, alignment, any, because you know what? Liars can be lawful good. No, uh, not liars. I'm, I know it, it, this one is totally different. Yeah. Hit dice D4, weapons club, dagger, dart, staff, armor, none. So typical stuff you would expect from a wizard. Spell use, the ability to cast arcane spells with intelligence of 13 to 15, one extra spell level. I, I like this. Nice and, nice and simple. Nice and simple. You don't have to try to figure out weird charts or whatever. Sharp senses, plus one to all illusion saving throws. You think you know your job pretty well, right? So you get a bonus too you know, based on your level and so forth, uh, to see through other people when they're doing weird crap to you, like, ha ha, liar. Um, all right. In a profession where skill is measured by power, there are those magi who use their powers to make a mockery of reality itself. Rare indeed are, okay, rare indeed are the illusionists. Now, as soon as you say that, that means everybody in the game is going to play one. <laughs> These are spellcasters who use the arcane to blend and blur and twist what is with what may be. I think that's a good description of this. I think that, is, again, I know Heathen Talk doesn't like the illusionists, but maybe, maybe we can pull them around. We could suck them in by some of this language here. They ply the minds of others and twist desire and perception. So it's not just making you see weird things, twisting desire and perception. I think that's where you had the hang up was the, the uh, whole illusionist thing. You wanted to treat it as the five senses, but it really did dig into the brain of the person that was being targeted uh, into deceptive and often deadly illusions. All right, let's go down. The illusionist uses magic to alter the perceptions of others and even reality itself. Again, I think this is where Heathen Dog had the hang up. He's OK with this part, not with this part. I'm okay with both. I like it. I like the illusionist. I like the way it's described in this game, and it makes it more meaningful than just I throw pretty colors out there. But no, no, when, uh, illusionist. The definition of the word me is fake. But when you can actually alter reality, you're Green Lantern. They they, they just turn him into Green Lantern, except they don't have a ring. So what? So so how do you feel about Earth Dawn, where if a Meryl Bolt is uh, fake, but true if a Meryl Bolt is real? It's the same, the same concept. An illusionist has to have some reality behind him, otherwise you would always disbelieve everything it does, and he couldn't do anything. But uh, this, this, uh, this magic deceives the senses, creates false images and sounds, changes sensory qualities, affects the mind's perception. So not only is it just putting out the illusion out there, but it is enchanting you to some degree using the Dungeons and Dragons version of the word enchanting. And some cases, uh, sorry, in some cases, fashions arcane energies into something real. Boom. Uh, all right, again, not going to read everything here. Powerful illusionists make loyal soldiers, uh, makes loyal soldiers out of brigands and fools out of professional military men and can, with magic, empower rabble to sweep trained armies from the field. By the way, you didn't even need any pronoun there. So again, correct your English. A keen intelligence and a depth of perception unknown to most men are required for the illusionist to master the complex relationship between magic, the mind, and the mundane. I'm really starting to feel the castles and crusades just pull a lot of this stuff from Earth done. I know they didn't. I'm not actually... But, but I, I like the blend. Maybe that's why I like Castles and Crusades the way they write so many things is because I see it in Earth Dawn, which is my favorite game. Illusionist may... Okay, I don't care about the alignment stuff. Weapons. Generally untrained in warfare because you're spending time trying to learn how to be your psychologist. Armor. Uh, while I'm reading this, if you see some good chat, go ahead and throw it up on the screen. Uh, 
Also, also because we haven't done this yet, be sure to subscribe. Like, share, and subscribe if you want to hear people rant about things. I mean, talk about games. Um, abilities. So, obviously, they can cast spells because, you know, they're spellcasters. The number of spells an illusionist has in his spell book at the beginning of the game of plays equal to the number of spells he can cast at uh, first level. All right, so we'll just look at the chart. So, look at that. Six. Wait, wait. Yeah, oh, it's six, because I keep forgetting zeroth level spells, yeah. I was like, two, yeah. but yeah, zeroth, zeroth level spells, you're right. With a high intelligence score, an illusionist gains bonus spells. If the character has intelligence between 13 and 15, he can memorize an extra one. Okay. So that's, and, that's the same for everybody. All, those, yeah. all the spellcasters have that. Which is why I'm scrolling down. Yeah. Uh, right, that's taken up the full side there. All right, sharp sense of illusionist. An illusionist innate ability to distinguish the real from the unreal in parts. A plus one bonus to all illusionist saving throws. Great sentence, much better than some of the other stuff you've written. The bonus increases to plus two, plus three at these levels. So every three levels, it looks like. Yeah, see, I don't... Mm, that is way too specific and... For what? To all well, illusions? Say, an no, illusions no, yeah, it's, uh, it's not useful. For an illusionist to counter another illusionist? In one certain situation, when all the other classes, uh, the, the, they get abilities at level four, level seven, level ten. If you If you scroll back and look, that's all they get. That's all they get. Sharp senses, sharp senses, sharp senses. They don't get any other powers. Hey, if it stops me from being brain fugled, I might be okay with that. Yeah, but that's <laughs> all it does. It doesn't. Well, all the other classes gave you know a, a much much broader benefit, where this is a very pinpoint specific benefit. Oh my god! <laughs> You're gonna see it in just a second here. Using magic and props, the illusionist can disguise himself. Will you please be fucking consistent? <laughs> Uh, this push is the through. right this is the right way to write it though so i give you a thumbs up for this one push through can disguise himself and impersonate others the effort requires one uh, d3 times 10 minutes of work okay uh just, this is just like the disguise from from earth done again disguise can include idiom parent change of height or weight of no more than one to wow that's kind of that's kind of low i mean that's kind of low but okay. i mean let's i mean look they gave anakin high heels so that he could look like darth vader so you know or uh, what's his name hayden christensen you know? Like, it depends, I guess, what you're doing. Um, following modifiers apply, disguise checks, uh, different sex, race, and so forth. Only minus two for a different race. I guess, you know, a human isn't going to try to be a dwarf, though. That just wouldn't work out. Well, yeah, you, you couldn't get the you couldn't get the height uh, yeah. percentage. Right. <laughs> I'm a tall dwarf. Yeah. Uh, all right. Looseness, high level progression. All right. See invisible at 13th level. Okay. That's uh, not you, again, very specific to illusion spells, but okay. Uh, or, or invisible creatures as a whole yeah. has learned to distinguish shades of light and because of this has a chance to see any invisible object or person 18th level abilities uh, can ask inside and shape of the target 24th master illusion is innate ability distinguish the real from the unreal reach supernatural level uh the illusion gains a second sight and may permanently see the reality of things wow wow well, what you're seeing now well, you know what i feel about that right now hang on hang on hang on a second <laughs> This is literally a max level illusionist. I'd give it to him. He got this far. Yep. I give it to him. You're the only guy in the world who has true seeing because you're a 20th level illusionist. Good job. There, there's like 10 of you maybe in the whole world. No, no. Oh, wait, hold on, Bruce. Now, anything that's a t-shirt can also be a mug. You just have to pick the mug. <laughs> Any, like, I, I think there are only a couple of items on our Redbubble store that uh, that aren't mugs, but I'm Pretty sure all of them can be mugs, except for like a couple of the ma the ones that are like mask only. Uh, so everything just there should be an option just to change it from T-shirt to I mean, that's how Heathen Dog got his tapestry that's behind him. I mean, that's just the Legion Myth logo. That's, you know, that it's the same thing as this <laughs> just on a tapestry. So, um, yeah, so so hopefully it's there. But uh, back to this intelligence, hey, intelligence bonus. bonus. Guess yep, what? normal. Level, get a plus yep. one. Detect, Detect magic. magic. Starting at 16th level, the illusionist long career allows him to detect telltale signs of magic without casting a spell. After five rounds of study and concentration, they can see the essence of an item, determining whether or not it is magical. Oh, here we go. With accessible intelligence check, the illusionist can ascertain the magic's origins, whether made by dwarves, elves, ancient civilizations. Okay, so you need a bard for the general history of an item, but the bard cannot see if it's magical. You need an illusionist 
to figure out if an item is magical and to study where that magic comes from and the aspect or ability the, that the uh, that the item has. Okay. At 18th level, Lucius can determine the power of the item, whether great or small, as well as its nature. Okay. Change self at 19th level. They can now alter their own persona, shaping themselves in a different guise, shape, or form. Illusions may change self at the spell as the spell once a day. Unlike the spell, the innate ability allows them to alter their racial appearance as well as the smell, sound, and even tactile sensations of their new identity. Additionally, the effect lasts until the illusion dispels it. The illusionist dispels it. Okay, so you can just it's a it's a permanent change self that is all five senses. I mean, it's, it's changed up. It's a transmutation spell. It's not just an illusion. Well, but it's not real. It's well, If I remember correctly uh, from D&D, the transmute changed self didn't give you all the powers of a creature. It just made you look like it. Now, it might give you claws, but it wouldn't give you like a displacer's beast displacing ability right. or whatever. And, uh, it, it doesn't say this one does either. It, it yeah, doesn't so, give me... so it, it reminds me of cha change self as the spell. So this is change self. This isn't an illusion that you're changing yourself. Alt, he's, he's altering. Yeah. Okay. Here's so, perfect recall again. Yep. Yeah, it seems like all the casters like get all the mages when they hit level twenty, they get to they get the which is fine. It only affects the cantrip, yeah. so yeah, it's fine. Uh, Magnum Opus at twenty fourth level. Okay. In a day long ritual. Seeing, what else do you want? Jesus, reach their Magnum Opus, the height of their spellcasting prowess. In a day long ritual, drawing power from the plane of shadow and combining the spells. Distort reality, mirage arcana, permanent image, polymorph any object, and shades. Master illusionists blend what lies in their mind's eye with that of the world around them. Magnum opus allows the illusionist to create any one object or being or one area of 10 by 10 per level with this ritual. An illusionist can create a being of half their level in hit dice. It possesses <laughs> all the powers of a normal creature of its type would. For instance, if a manticore is created, it can fly, shoot spikes, etc. That's awesome. Hang on. The illusion reflects perfection. So great is the power of the illusion that it cannot be dispelled for one day per level of the caster, except by a wizard or illusionist of uh, equal so, or greater So, And ability. how many times are you just going to run into the random 24th level? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? But you know what? If, if I were a 24th level illusionist and I wanted to make the perfect creature, I don't think I'd choose a manticore. Uh, what doesn't? Hey, what if what if the village you're going to has either a religious uh, fear of or a religious uh, awe based on a manticore? You could do a lot with that. Yeah, I'd still want the know. perfect stripper. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> win. I can't argue that you win. <laughs> I mean, come on. You get to make one perfect anything. What do you want? Oh, I don't know. Always a T-Rex, Baron G-Rock says. Always a T-Rex. No, never a T-Rex. <laughs> no. Boobs on a T-Rex don't look right. God. <laughs> you can only attempt a magnum opus once per month. They must spend a day. Oh, no, but it lasts how time. long? Days? <laughs> yeah. And you have to have all those spells. Yep. Distort reality, mirage arcana, permanent image, polymorph any object, and shades. You have to have those spells. So here we go. It's completely flipped the script down a little bit. An illusory sword created to slay a powerful monster may indeed become a physical object. See, you don't have to make a manticore. A landscape created by this ritual may become a real place. Now you're really getting earth dawny on us. Yep. With all, uh, wow. Okay. So it's, I like, thank you for this example. I think this is a really good example because it's getting people out of the idea of just saying, well, you just make a monster. No, no, no. You can do so much more with this. So good example. That, that's person, excellent. Person, in quotes, because it's a stripper, obviously. So person <laughs> created by strippers are people too. Not in my experience. Uh, the master illusionist uh, and, and, her brother are said to be products of this ritual. Each claims to be the true person while the other is the result of the Magnum Opus taking on a life of its own. Well, he made a stripper and apparently the stripper turned into instead of the perfect stripper, the perfect illusionist. Okay. Uh, read the last sentence before the example. Okay. The image becomes real, cannot be dispelled or disbelieve. And a paladin's cleanse soul ability will not reveal it as ever having been an illusion. Oh, wow. no. uh, ritual effect is a 1% chance per the illusionist level to become real. 
So 24% chance at 24th level because you can only do this at 24th level. So there's a there's almost a one in four chance of whatever you make being permanent and real forever. So what was it about the illusionist not having power? <laughs> they just have to wait to uh, get investment. You're investing yeah, okay. in the <laughs> I, I like this illusionist better than the than the seventh printing illusionist. Do we know that it's any different? Anybody in chat, be, uh, how different is this from seventh printing? Because yeah, maybe, uh, maybe I'm just remembering it wrong, but this this seems a lot more illusiony instead of like uh, just I can do anything I want. Or maybe maybe just time has healed the wound a little bit, and that's entirely possible. Not uh, like okay, it, entirely possible. I think we end this today because we've got a bunch of classes yeah. to do next week. And I, I mean, we've got the night and we've got, uh, what else we have here? Uh, the night was actually one I think we liked in seventh, uh, printing. Yeah. Uh, wow. Is that, is this all nights? Jesus. <laughs> uh, then we oh, got wait. the monk, you know, we got a lot, we got a lot more to go through. So, uh, we'll do the rest of the class.